You're listening to the Men's Dating Mastery Podcast with host Alec Chase, bringing you the experts in dating, sex, and relationships. Hello, fellas and ladies, because I know that you're out there listening too. Welcome to episode 15 of the MDM Podcast. I have an amazing, amazing episode for you today. I have played this back to myself several times already, and wow, every time I listen, I extract new and powerful insights. Not only is there a ton of value in this episode, but I also have some free giveaways for you, so keep listening. My guest today is someone who I have a great deal of respect for. His name is Frank Kermit, and he's a dating and relationship expert. Frank is a veteran of the seduction community, a certified trauma counselor, a certified hypnotherapist, an author of numerous books and products, a regular presence in the media, and the coach of coaches. Most notably, however, Frank is a man with a big heart who's genuinely out to help people. I think you will come to the same conclusion by the time you're done listening to this interview. We set out to record a 30-minute conversation, but Frank was sharing so much powerful insight that we ended up speaking for almost two hours, which is why this is a two-part episode. The topic of our conversation is the 10 emotional needs of women. Here, in part one, Frank explains what emotional needs are, and more importantly, what they are not. He talks about the mother-lover theory, which underpins how a woman responds to a man's behavior in the context of each of her emotional needs, And we cover the first five of the 10 emotional needs of women. The remaining five are covered in part two. These needs are highly interrelated, so I encourage you to listen to these two parts in sequence so that you can make sense of everything. Now, I told you that I had some free stuff for you and that Frank is a man with a truly big heart. Well, Frank is giving away three free products that you can get just for listening to this podcast. Now, these are not some superficial products used as a form of online marketing. These are serious, in-depth materials that represent over $270 in value. For this reason, they will be available for free only until September 16th of 2015. After that, you will only be able to get them by buying them, like everybody else. So I suggest that you grab them now while they are still free. The first of these products is a three-set audio program called The Art of Charisma, From Creepy to Charisma. Since my last guest, Patty Contenta, spoke at length about charisma and referenced Frank's work on the subject, you can head over to the show notes for episode 14 called Using Body Language to Create Attraction. In those show notes, you will find a link under the title Free Giveaway, which will guide you to the download page. The link for those show notes is mensdatingmastery.com forward slash podcast dash Patty Consenta. The second product is an ebook called The Emotional Needs of Women, which is what this episode is based on. Coincidentally, the introduction to this book was written by Patty Consenta as well. To get the book, go to the show notes for this episode at mensdatingmastery.com forward slash Frank Kermit one. That is the number one, not the word. And click under the same title, free giveaway, which will lead you to the download page for Frank's ebook. If you can't remember both those URLs, then just head over to mensdatingmastery.com and browse through the podcast page. It's pretty easy to find. For the third product, well, you will have to tune into part two of this interview to find out what it is and where to find it. Actually, there's even a fourth product which you can get for free by subscribing to Frank's newsletter at franktalks.com forward slash newsletter. This is a book with a collection of Frank's best articles on the topics of love, sex, dating, and relationships. Frank has given away these products just for you tuning in to listen to the show with the hope that you will keep coming back. No strings attached. But like I said, the links I mentioned will remain active until September 16th, 2015, at which point I will take them down. So take advantage while you can. On a separate note, 
As this episode is going live, Frank is heading into surgery. So on behalf of myself and on behalf of Men's Dating Mastery, I would like to wish Frank good health and a speedy recovery. We need you strong and healthy, Frank, so that you can continue to share your wisdom with the people who need it most. That's enough talking from me. Now let's bring in Frank Kermit. Hey, Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So I have to tell you that out of all the guests that I've had on the show, you must have the longest resume I've seen to date. I was sitting down, I was jotting down some notes in preparation for a conversation and I filled out a full page and I still wasn't done. So can you kick it off by just introducing yourself and what you do and specifically tell the audience about your involvement over the years in the sphere of seduction, dating, relationships, as well as some of the formal qualifications that you have, because you've got more than a few. All right. Well, it started off when uh, I graduated high school and I was stood up at my prom. Sometime after that, I lost my ex fiance to one of my best friends. Sometime after that, I hung out with a girl for about two years who always insisted that we could never date because we were too different of a different race, religion, and culture. And then one day she surprises me by telling me she's getting married to a guy who was just like me, a different race, religion, and culture. And that was what I call my strike three. Those were the three traumatic experiences of my life that shattered my self-worth, self-identity. And that's, that night is when I decided that either I was going to figure out dating, relationship, seduction, whatever you want to call it, or I was going to kill myself. And at that point, I just started seeking out people who I knew, friends of mine that were always really good with women, and just asking, look, can I hang out with you? Can I just talk to you? Can I just figure this out? Because there had to be an answer. This whole concept of, well, you can't really explain it. You'll know when you know I don't buy it. There has to be an answer. There's got to be some mechanism at work. We just haven't figured it out yet. And it was in the process after I hung out with them and I still could not make it work. Um, I started planning to kill myself and it was in planning to kill myself where I was selling some of the books and, and whatnot that I had collected that I came across the seduction community. Decided, okay, well, I'll try this because, again, you know, I'm going for broke. Um, purchased a few products, started to apply the material, and I started to get positive results. It took me three years of trial and error to develop what I call my emotional needs theories. And this is where if somebody told me to do something, I did it. I tried it. And then I documented everything I had ever done. I, I kept a journal in detail. And the journal included times when I was talking to a girl and got a response and trying to figure out, okay, I got a response then. I got a response when I talked to this other girl. What was the combination? What was, what was in common? And through that came out my emotional needs theories, where I saw that when I did very specific behaviors, I got a positive result from women. It was three years of on and off trial and error, and I didn't get laid in those three years. That was part of a five-year dry spell I was in. And finally, it happened, was with a girl, very passionate, had sex for the first time in five years. And I just did exactly with the other girls that I did with her. Same behaviors, same ways of expressing certain life experiences I've had. I don't lie to women, never have. What I do is that I properly present things that have happened to me, but there's ways, different ways you can present it. You can present it where you're constantly negative about it, or you can present it as, yeah, this bad thing happened, but this is what I learned from it, and this is how it's changed me as a person. After that first sexual encounter, within about five months, I ended up with five lovers and girlfriends at the same time just working a weekly rotation. And what I was doing at the time is that I was continuing to apply my emotional needs theories, finding out what does work, what doesn't work, when it works, and for what type of girl. Because the five girls that I was seeing at the same time were very different personalities. 
They had some emotional needs in common. They had emotional needs which were very different. And that's where I was learning how to calibrate. Short time after that, after seven years apart, I actually got my ex-fiance back. And we resumed a relationship that lasted about two to three months. And when we ended it, we ended it as friends. But I got closure on that relationship. And around that time, I experienced my first poly date. It was Valentine's Day. I was seeing two different girls at the same time. They both knew of each other. They had never met. And I told both of them, I don't want to have to choose. I want to see you both on Valentine's Day. So I made reservations at a restaurant, table for three, that it had to be set a certain way. I invited both of them. I went to pick both of them up. They both sat in the back seat together. I sat in the front seat of the car driving. And I gave them ample time throughout the date, because we had more than one location to go to, uh, to get to know each other. And it was just an amazing experience. Like, you know, coming from the background I had, just to experience this, it, it was phenomenal. So that was pretty much it. I went from the loser to seducer. It's the title of my autobiography. And in documenting everything, you have to understand that I never intended to become a coach in this business. My goal was to write out my life story, set it out there, let it help people, and then disappear. Well, that didn't happen. What ended up happening is that a lot of my friends saw how I was progressing, so they started coming to me for advice. Then they started referring me to other people, and I started giving advice. I started holding little groups at coffee shops where everybody was just taking notes, and I was just telling them the things that I had learned. Next thing you know, I'm getting fed up because it's eating up all of my time. No time to date girls when you're teaching a bunch of guys. One guy says to me one day, Frank, are you ever going to write a book? And I thought, yeah, you know what? I think I'm just going to write a book and, and that'll be it. And once I write my book, no one will come to me for questions anymore. The opposite happened. Wrote the book, people bought the book, and they had even more questions. Advanced level questions. How do I apply it in real life? How do I apply it in real time? For each question that came up, new product, new book, audio lecture, you name it, put it out there thinking, okay, I've answered your questions now, you'll leave me alone. That didn't happen. And more and more people just kept coming to me, asking for advice, finally started to charge for my time. And at this point, I'm making a full-time living as a coach doing this. Where I am today... Uh, I do a lot of media, a lot of live AM radio. I do a lot of internet interviews such as this. Some television appearances where I've appeared as an expert in dating and relationships. I've gone back to school. I got a certificate in trauma counseling just because I find a lot of the clients I have, men and women, couples, singles, adult-aged virgins, uh, all have some kind of traumatic incident in their background. And as a coach, I can be open about my past. I don't keep a professional distance. I get to know them as I would get to know a new friend. And I share my personal stories with them through the coaching process while I'm teaching them about the emotional needs of men and women. That is a very powerful story, Frank. And thank you for sharing it. Thank you for opening up like that. I, I can't imagine the kind of pain that you must have been feeling in your early day. And what's striking to me is that I've heard a number of people who are now coaches in the industry who had a similar experience of pain where they were borderline suicidal. And I think we sometimes forget just how much of a pillar romantic relationships are in our lives and how critical they are to our well-being. And I think that definitely demonstrates so. One thing I would like to say is that in our moments of trauma, in our moments of crisis, we often find our life calling. You know, the people who grew up never having enough food for Thanksgiving end up dedicating their lives to creating wealth and starting foundations to help needy people. Our life callings are always in our moments of crisis. So with every moment of crisis, there's something for all of us to learn. Absolutely. And that's a wonderful way of looking at it. You mentioned that you started with developing products and developing insights into 
emotional needs. And that's what I'd like to dedicate the greater portion of this conversation to. And I'd like to start with the 10 emotional needs of women that you've identified. So could you tell us what they are and provide examples of how these needs show up in everyday life and how men can respond to them appropriately? Absolutely. Let's start off with a very key concept. And if you can understand this concept, you can understand emotional needs. First of all, an emotional need is about what a person responds to, not about what they like. Intellectually, they think to themselves, I would like a really nice person to come into my life. This is both men and women. But emotionally, we don't always respond to what's best for us we respond to some kind of stimuli. And whether or not that stimuli is good for us, we have an emotional response to us. That's our attraction mechanism. That's what causes us to be attracted to certain types of people. If we can reprogram our own attraction mechanism, we can then focus on dating people who are better suited for us. Most people don't do that. Most people are on autopilot. Our attraction mechanism comes from the way we learn to survive as children. If I grew up in a household that was emotionally abusive, as a child, I will make certain connections in my brain. I see if I simply supplicate to the person who is abusive to me, I will survive. Then we take that attitude into our adult lives. If I supplicate to people, then they will allow me, they will like me, they will allow me to continue living. That doesn't work when you're an adult, because at that point, you're in the position to provide for yourself in terms of your own survival. But the attraction mechanism has been in-depthly programmed. That's what an emotional need is. It's something we respond to, not necessarily something that we like. When we're looking at the emotional needs of women, in order to get them to respond with either some kind of sexual attraction where they want sex or emotional attraction where they feel a sense of being in love. I have worked it out in my practice. and This is how I teach it. A woman can either be one of two roles in any man's life. She can be his mother or she can be his lover. She cannot be both. This is what happens in long-term relationships. I'll sometimes have a much older couple. They've been together for 20 years. They come into the room and she says, I'm not in love with him anymore. And he's a good guy. He's never beaten her, never cheated on her. They've had their problems, but there's never been anything that would make somebody say, oh, you got to leave this guy. All she can say is, I don't know why. I just don't feel it anymore. And she thinks that she's going to be happy walking away from this family, screwing up the kids, and then getting used by a bunch of men who want to bang her, but not ever commit to her. Here's what's happened in those long-term relationships. Over the course of time, she has stopped feeling like his lover and more and more started feeling like his mother. And with what I'm about to tell you now, these are the top 10 emotional needs of women. There's more emotional needs out there, but these are the top 10 that I've identified. That if you address these emotional needs continuously, she can't ever stop being attracted to you. Are you ready for this? Ready, let's go. Okay, emotional need number one, the protection of her reputation. A person's reputation is their their most powerful asset, their credibility. There are people who make entire livings off their credibility, off their reputation, and a person's reputation can also dictate if they end up alone and abandoned in the world. A woman, especially if she's younger, has to be very mindful of what her reputation is. It is the man who demonstrates that not only does he protect her reputation, but he protects all reputations of people, even if the man has been wronged by certain people. If a guy starts telling this girl, this new girl that he's met, oh yeah, well, you know, I've had sex with that girl and I've had sex with that girl. Her first thought is, so if I have sex with you, you'll be telling everybody about it. Regardless of militant feminism right now that is empowering women to go out there and be as sexual as men, there is still a stigma for women with multiple partners. There was a survey done by Ask Men, and it shows that the more sexual partners a woman has, the less percentage of the male population that is interested in being in a serious relationship with her. They'll still want to have sex with her, but they won't want a serious relationship with her, which means that by the time she's 40 or 50, she'll be alone in a cat lady. 
So the guy who says, you know what? I don't talk about that element of my life. If you and I become involved, if we become serious, I might share that part of my life with you, but it's not something that I share with the public in general. She knows that no matter what happens between her and him, he will be discreet because he's always discreet. He's always mindful of people's reputations. If in, in casual conversation, let's say you're, you're in a group event that's mixed men and women, and somebody says, hey, whatever happened between you and that other person that you had the falling out with? If you go into all the details, every girl at that table knows, oh, so if we have a falling out, if I make a mistake, if something happens, or if there's a misunderstanding, you're just going to be vocal about it. She knows that you may apply it to her. If you respond by protecting people's reputation and saying, well, we had a falling out and I'm disappointed about it, but there's no real need to go into that now. There are certain things I don't discuss in public. You will end up being that one guy that probably has sexual experiences with many women friends, meaning the women that are cur currently in your life, your social circles, It'll be women who all know each other, but they don't all know that they've all been intimate with you at some point. And by the way, protection of a reputation for those guys who, for whatever reason, they come off very creepy. They just don't have the ability to calibrate. Changing this one specific behavior completely changes how the women around them treat them. By that, you mean how they discuss their relationships with other women? Exactly. Just the fact that when a guy stops trying to be a jokester, constantly putting other people down, constantly, you know, targeting the reps of everybody else, even if it's done in fun. When I work with these guys, let's say an adult male virgin who for his entire life, he could be 30, 40 years old, still never was able to get on a date because every girl says, let's just be friends. What are these guys doing? They behave in a way where she has reason to believe that her reputation would not be safe with him, regardless of what happens between them. When I teach these guys who, they're nice guys, they just come off a little creepy, uncalibrated, socially awkward. When they learn, I have to protect everybody's reputation. I never have to put someone else down in order to make myself look good. What these guys end up discovering is that their social circles start I recognizing, hey, You've changed. You're a little different. You're, there's something going on for you. And the attraction starts to build. Or at the very least, the mothering instinct is halted. Now, how does this apply to the mother-lover theory? If a woman is around a guy where she senses my reputation would not be 100% safe with him, her guard goes up. She enters a mothering mode. Not necessarily becoming his mommy. But just the fact that her, because her guard is up, she has to think like a mother who's around a small child and has to be there to sort of, oh, I got to watch what I say. I got to watch what I do. I got to, you know, I can't fully be myself. I can't fully let go because the child who's with me may go ahead and repeat this somewhere else. That evokes the mothering instinct. But when he behaves in a manner that protects her reputation, her guard is dropped. Now she has the potential to become his lover. She can be herself. She can say or do whatever she wants. She feels freed up from that burden of having to keep her guard up. So that's an, that's an example of how the mother-lover theory applies with emotionally, number one, protection of her reputation. And guys, if you're listening to this and if you don't want to buy the book, that's okay. Just apply this rule across the board. Protect people's reputations. You're going to see a significant difference with the way people interact with you. Okay, so let's uh, go on to emotional need number two. Emotionally, number two, she wants to experience a range of emotion. For women to experience a range of emotion, it allows them to feel alive. She wants to feel. Now, I say it like this because this is the way that men learn. As men, we don't want to be encumbered. We don't want to be stopped by multiple emotions. It drives us nuts. Too much emotion forces us to shut down and say, look, I, I got to go away into the tool shed here for a few hours. We got to decompress. 
for women, that's how they process the world. There's just so much emotion going around. One of the challenges for guys and girls is that the guy who wants, oh, I really want that really hot girl. Well, that really hot girl is probably really hot and beautiful because she has a high need for emotional range. Another word for emotional range is drama. So when he's going after the really hot girls, but he doesn't like the way she's acting and behaving, there is a conflict. The way you will manage any relationship is to figure out just how much emotional range you can handle and seek out a woman who gives you that level of emotional range or lower. Now, emotional range might mean that, depending on the girl, she might try to pick a fight when there's really nothing to argue about. Emotional range could be she just needs a sense of humor where one minute she's feeling down, but he's got a great sense of humor and it just sparks her from that, you know, feeling bad to feeling really good. When women say, I like a guy with a sense of humor, that's what she means. I want a guy to give me a variety of emotions. Now, what happens if the guy is always negative and all the emotions that he's able to give to a woman are just constantly negative emotions? Her guard's got to go up. If the guy doesn't really have anything going on, maybe he's dealing with some level of depression. Maybe he's just never been the type of guy that was ever encouraged to go out and do things for himself. He comes across as boring, nice, a good guy, doesn't stir the waters much. Well, that type of boredom causes her to say, well, if I'm not going to get emotional range from this guy, I got to do it for myself. Hence, the mothering instinct kicks in. Her guard goes up. She has to say, I have to be the adult here. As opposed to the guy who once in a while says, hey, I picked this flower for you. Who goes to a dollar store and for 50 cents buys one of these keychains with a little cutesy thing. Oh, you know, I was out today and I was thinking of you. (gasps) Wow. All this emotional range for her. And that's for a lot of girls. That's all it takes. Just the fact that he thought about her and he's giving her emotional range. For guys, when we experience multiple levels of emotion, like when we experience emotions like anger, it could be overwhelming for us. According to Dr. Steve Stosny, who um, I I took a three-day seminar on domestic violence intervention, the two emotions that men respond to very differently than women are shame and guilt. When a man experiences shame and guilt, we can experience it so deeply that it's not uncommon for guys going through shame and guilt to to want to self-sabotage, want to destroy themselves. You see this in some divorces where the guy feels so much shame and guilt that he's even going through the process of divorce that he agrees to things that he shouldn't be agreeing to because on some level he feels he's got to be punished. When a woman experiences shame, guilt, and anger, and even though these negative emotions... It's just an emotion that she's experiencing amongst a range. I don't know what it is. I still haven't been able to pinpoint what it is, but women have what's what I would call some level of emotional sophistication where they can deal with certain emotions better than men. And that's why they need these multiple levels of emotion to feel alive. If he's not doing things that's giving her a little bit of drama, a little bit of emotional range, if he's not doing it and leading the relationship by offering little things like that, could be something, you know, something as simple as, honey, get dressed. I'm taking you out. We're going to go someplace for dessert. Something that simple. Okay. And something you're going to do in a relationship anyway. If he doesn't do those things, she has to do it for herself. Mothering instinct gets kicked in. If he's doing all these things, mothering instinct is halted. The potential for her to become a lover a lover, is there. So what I find interesting is you're not just talking about making her feel emotions. You're talking about a range of emotions. A range and, of emotion. Yeah. And so the examples that you provided are examples of positive emotions. How would negative emotions factor into this? Is that something that should be avoided or is that something that you might actually want to create to a certain extent in order to provide that range? After so many years of practice, my answer is it depends on the girl, depends what she can handle. 
uh, ways to bring in some negative emotions could be a really sad documentary that evokes her sympathies, that makes her cry. Could be a scary movie. Get the blood jumping, the excitement, the fear. Uh, again, sense of humor is very important here because depending on the humor, the crude jokes, sometimes just being able to say what's on your mind, even if, even if you know it's going to upset her, gives her some of those range of emotion. But saying what's on your mind, especially when she's doing something and you say, look, I, I don't feel comfortable with this. I really don't. For example, and, and this is uh, what I use for, uh, for couples who are in monogamous relationships. And there's certain behaviors that you, you got to commit to if you want to maintain the monogamy of your relationship. Great example here. A girl says, hey, look, I've been with you. We've been dating for six months. Everything is good. My girlfriend just broke up with her boyfriend. She wants to go out on a night on the town, and I'm going to go with her. She's going out to pick up guys. And you're saying, yeah, look, um, we're supposed to be in a monogamous relationship. We agree to commit to one another. Well, why can't your girlfriend go out with other girls who are single? Because she's going out to pick up with guys. And look, if you're a guy, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> the guy's going to bring in his friends, and they're going to try to wing him, you know, wingman thing there. And it's just not a place to be putting yourself. What do a lot of guys do? I, I don't want to say anything. I don't want her to think that I'm telling her what to do. I don't want her to think that I'm trying to control her. I don't want her to think I'm insecure. Bottom line is it's driving you nuts. And in your mind, you're thinking, if we had just started seeing each other or if we had uh, discussed an open relationship, yeah, that's fine. But we made the point of making a commitment and I'm not comfortable with this. Say it. And say it in that matter, not in the sense that you're accusing her, but you're saying, this is not behavior that I agree to. And it's really crossing a boundary for me. Sometimes just standing your ground is enough to give her some of that emotional range too. So what kind of negative emotions? You want to bring up some negative emotions, but it has to be in context. Going out of your way to insult her, to be mean, to be hurtful. Are there women who respond to that? Yes. Why? Because they grew up in environments where taking that kind of abuse equaled survival when they were children and they're carrying that now. We've, we've talked about this. I would never advocate that. If the only way that you can give a, the woman in your life an emotional range is to be abusive, stop the relationship. Even, and, and I've seen this with a lot of guys who went into the seduction community that were good guys who adopted bad behaviors and they became jerks. You're, you're going to suffer for becoming a jerk because once those behaviors are, entr are entrenched in you, they're not that easy to get rid of. And you have to be able to respect yourself before any woman can totally respect you. Right. You know, as you're talking about this, I thought one way to create an emotional range could just be in the context of flirting, particularly when you're meeting a woman for the first time. One term that's often used is push-pull and showing interest and then being aloof a little bit. And so that little back and forth, but in a playful manner. And so I'd like to emphasize the word playful, that it's you're not being emotionally hurtful, but you're riding it like a wave rather than being flat. I am so happy you used the word playful because even something like push-pull can get abusive because you're really just trying to screw somebody up and get them mixed up. And the type of women who are going to walk away from that, the problem isn't with the woman. Problems with you and the way you're doing it. It's the women who stay that you need to be worried about. Yeah, it's the woman that walks away is the one that you actually want. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the third emotional need. Emotional need number three, cater to the little girl in her. This was taught to me by, um, he's known as Doc, Dr. Amir Sambangi. And what he does is that he literally will do something with the girl that will make her feel like she's a kid again. And it could be anything from getting her to describe her favorite flavored lollipop to remembering something that she did as a kid, uh, going to the circus, or actually doing things with her now that she would have done as a child. Take her to out for an ice cream cone. I remember one girl that I was dating, and I took her out and was a dessert uh, cafe. And I just, for, for no reason at all, I told her, I'm going to feed you. 
And she looked at me like I was crazy. And she says, this, no, you're not. And I said, yes, I am. So what I did is that I took a fork full of her cake or whatever it was that she had, her pastry, and I fed her. And she's eating it and she's feeling ridiculous. And she's saying, you know, I don't know what it is you're trying to do here. And I said, I'm not trying to do anything. I want you to have a good time. And I continued doing it. And by the third spoonful, she was smiling. She was giggling. She was actually acting like a child. Now, how does this relate to mother lover theory? Well, if she feels safe enough to let the child inside come out a bit and play and explore, She's not being the adult in the moment. She's not being the mother. Now, with this emotional need, you have to remember one very clear rule. You never try to get sexual with her when she's in child mode. The only girls who will get sexual with you when she's in child mode, probably, again, we would look at her past history. This is probably a girl that grew up in an environment where she may have been sexually abused. This is a red flag that you have to be on the lookout for. So you'll do something with her, make her feel like a kid, and then you'll stop that action. You'll stop feeding them. You'll stop, you know, uh, reading them nursery rhymes or whatever the thing is. And then maybe you'll try to get them back into adult mode, like asking them, well, listen, um, what time did you want to wake up tomorrow morning? Because uh, do you have to go to work? You have to go to school. Bring them back into adult mode. You can get them into a tickle fight, get them into adult mode. And from that point on, I always tell guys, wait 20 minutes from the time you've really addressed emotional need number three. Because here's what happens. And a lot of guys will come to me and say, I can't believe this happened. This has happened to me as well. If you are addressing emotional need number three, cater to the little girl and she's in that little girl mode. And that's when you give her a hug. And of course, being a guy, you're saying, hey, this is a hug. And you start to move your hands to her private parts, you reach in to give her a kiss, you try to get sexual with her, she might have a really bad reaction like, oh my God, and like just, you know, step away from you. She won't even know why. And later in the date, she might say, I don't know why, it's just in that moment, I, I didn't want to, but I really do like you. And she's spending the rest of the night saying, look, but I really like you and I don't know why I did that. I really like you, but I don't know why I did that. I'm telling you why she's doing that. Because when she's in that little girl mode, Getting sexual with her makes her feel unsafe. That is fascinating. So you're saying that she actually, in, in more ways than just on a, on a purely superficial, playful level, she's really going into that psychological state of where she is really just like a little girl. And so that translates into how she might respond to your advances. Exactly. Um, there's something called age regression. This is when adults start behaving as if they're children all the time. Um, this is, uh, one of the symptoms of being with someone who is emotionally abusive, sometimes physically abusive. An abuser will keep someone so childlike because it's easier to manipulate them. So you have to address this emotional need, but you have to be mindful. And ethical it sounds like absolutely i have a three cd set called how to be the ethical seducer because just the premise for some guys is i want to go out there and get laid well you know what if all you want to do is get laid just go to prostitutes okay get yourself a sugar baby if that's all you want and you just want to get laid and you don't actually want to form some connections with women there are models out there that are set up for you to just get your sex don't get involved in women's emotional realities of all you want to do is get laid because there's a lot more efficient ways to do it. If you're going to get involved in their emotional realities, I personally recommend that you take on some ethical boundaries with you just to make sure that you don't end up doing something that you or her will regret. Okay. I am tempted to drill further on that one, but just in the interest of time, let's go on to number four. Emotional need number four. I used to use the word dominance to describe what it is that I mean. I have found that a lot of guys have taken the word dominance, and I don't want to say a lot of guys, but a significant enough number will take the word dominance and think, oh, I got to be domineering. No. The word I use now is you must be assertive. Mm -hmm. Okay. And assertive just means that you're a decision maker, that you can make decisions. Now, for any guy who's listening to this, let's say that uh, you were on, 
you are on anti-depression medication. One of the things, one of the side effects of that is that it might be a bit harder for you to make decisions. And that's going to factor into whether or not women will be attracted to you. The guy who's able to be assertive, to make decisions, to say, hey, this is my boundary, and I don't like my boundary being crossed. The guy who is assertive, mother-lover theory again, she does not have to be the adult. She can lower her guard because he's taking charge of things. He's making the phone calls. He's taking care of certain things. Wow, I don't have to mother this guy. I don't have to tell him what to do. I don't have to always hear, I don't know, what do you want to do? Now, if you want to get if you want to get her opinion, that's fantastic. But at some point, she wants you simply to make a decision and move forward. Making the wrong decision is better than making no decision. So you you get together with your girl one night and you say something like, "Honey, I feel like going out to dinner tonight. Do you have any suggestions?" And she says, "Oh, I don't know. What do you want to do?" And you turn around to her and say, "I don't know. What do you want to do?" You're forcing her to take the mothering role. You're forcing her to put her guard up. And now I got to be the adult and I got to make these decisions. If you say, honey, do you have uh, two or three different places? She says, well, I'd like to get some fast food maybe because there's a new fast food restaurant that just opened across the street. Oh, but that new movie came out. Maybe we should go grab a movie and then grab a bite to eat afterwards. Or better yet, um, you know, the the weather is changing. I'd like to go up on the uh, local hill and uh, enjoy the lookout from there. If you continue to say, honey, whatever you want to do is fine with me. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. Chances are you're a good guy, a nice guy. You don't stir the waters because you want to make her happy. That's okay. Making her happy is a good thing. But when making her happy is the only emotion she's feeling with you, what are you violating? When you're constantly trying to make her happy and that's all you want to do, baby, whatever you want to do is fine with me. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. I just want to make you happy. You're actually violating emotional need number two. She wants the range. That's right. By being that nice guy, you're essentially creating a very flat emotional experience. I see what you're saying. Now, look, I want to make it clear. Being a nice guy is okay. Being a nice guy, just because you always want to make her happy, no matter what, even when you are, you know, not being assertive enough to even suggest things that you would want to do. That's when it becomes bad. And if she's always being made happy and she's always being made happy, you know what? She's bored because she only has that one emotion. So if you turn around and say, after she gives you that list of options and you say, you know what? Let's go out to a fast food place and we'll take a, we'll, we'll grab it for takeout. And then we're going to go up on the lookout. I've made the decision. That's what we're going to do. And if a few, you know, half hour later, she says, oh, but you know what? I, I, I really would like to see that movie. You stick to your guns. You say, look, we've already decided what we're going to do tonight. We'll go to the movie sometime this weekend. But right now, let's just follow through on this. And if she gets upset with you, you know, you're being such a jerk. You're being so hard-headed. You're being so stubborn. What emotional need are you now addressing? You're addressing number four because you're being assertive. And you're addressing number two. You're giving her emotional range. As long as you're not afraid to upset her. And I'm not talking about upsetting her by being abusive or saying things to be mean. I'm talking about if she's not going to be happy in the moment, you have to be comfortable with that. Right. And I'm seeing how all of these interrelate. Yeah. It's interesting that none of them are really there in isolation. They all play off each other. When I was going through my personal development, that's what I call that three-year period, I didn't identify all 10 emotional needs. I identified, let's say, four or five. But then when I started teaching it, I found that there were very specific emotional needs that I had to teach separate from the, you know, bigger umbrella emotional need. For example, emotional need number five is fear of abandonment, but it's a huge umbrella because so many other things fall under fear of abandonment, but I've had to teach these other emotional needs specifically because by being mindful of these specific emotional needs, once you start addressing 10 out of 10, and in, and when you get good at this, 
Within a 20-minute conversation, you can address all 10 emotional needs two or three times, just in the way you speak, in the way you act, that women just end up feeling something for you, and they can't explain it. Emotional needs is not something that is logically explained. That's why these women who have been with their husbands for 20 years are coming into the office saying, I don't know why, I just don't feel it anymore. Maybe it's because he didn't get a raise at work. They look for reasons to blame. The fact is they are not able to articulate why they are and are not attracted. That's why there's no point in asking a girl, why don't you like me? She doesn't know. All she knows is what she responds to. That same girl who today does not find you attractive in about six months when you are addressing emotional needs consistently, you re-enter her life or you allow her to re-enter your life. And she says, wow, you're different. I have to recategorize you all over again because you're so different. The same girl who said, you know what? I just don't feel it. I think we should be friends is going to be the same girl who will be naked in your bed saying, I love you. And she won't know why she'll say it was just something that happened. Right. Now getting back to uh, emotionally number four, being assertive, you know, it, it's self-explanatory. If you're the one who's assertive, she doesn't have to be, she doesn't have to be the adult. She doesn't have to have her guard up. She doesn't have to be the mommy of the relationship. She gets to enjoy the ride. And if you are doing it right, she has the potential to be your lover. This is one of the things that long-term couples struggle with because especially when they start having kids together and the way she takes care of the kid, she starts taking care of her man too. Next thing you know, she starts feeling mothering towards her man and the problems begin. Let's go to emotional need number five, fear of abandonment. It's not so much that she says, I never want to be abandoned by you, but if she's meeting you right now, she wants to know that she could earn your commitment. Key word in there is earn. So you don't have to say to the girl, I'll be with you forever because that's not realistic. And we know that's not realistic. Here's what is realistic. If someone continually earns your loyalty, would you stick around? Of course. That's realistic. And that's what she needs to know. She needs to know what she has to do to continually earn your commitment. And if you have, if you know what you want, if you know the lifestyle you want, you can communicate those things to her on a date. So that's interesting because I can imagine two very, very different scenarios. So if you are on the lookout for a relationship that makes very intuitive sense, but what if you're not on the lookout for a relationship or maybe you are, but not a traditional type? Maybe you're looking to date her, but to also date other women. How can you apply exactly what you just said in that kind of context and still address that same emotional need? Okay. If you're looking for, let's say, to establish an open relationship. Either an open relationship or maybe something short term, basically anything other than a long term committed monogamous relationship. Okay. You can still not abandon someone, even if you're no longer dating them. As long as someone is good to me and respectful to me, I will always protect their reputation. I will always hold them in high regard. Just, you know, and, and this is something that, that I pride myself on personally, because the majority of my ex lovers and girlfriends I'm on good terms with We're friends on Facebook. Some of my ex lovers and girlfriends have actually become coaching clients and I'm helping them connect with, with new partners going forward in the future. And why do I still maintain that level of connection with them? Because if I like them enough to have sex with them and if I like them enough to date them, it's because they're generally good people. Okay. It didn't work out between us. Maybe somebody made a mistake, you know, maybe, maybe they did something they shouldn't have done. And I said, I'm sorry, that crosses my boundaries and I can't see you anymore. But do I go around saying, oh, you know, she's a this and she's a that? No, I can still honor her as a person. I don't have to call her the B word or, or the S word or whatever it is. I, I can still treat her like a human being and say, it just didn't work out between us. As long as people are respectful to me, I will be respectful to them. Loyalty is something that once earned is not something you take away. And if a person makes a mistake, you have to say, was the person malicious or, or, they just, or did they make a goof? 
So when I'm talking to girls and I'm saying, you know, what it is I want long term, even if what I want long term and what she wants long term is very different. I want to buy a house in the country. She wants to live in the downtown core. There's an incompatibility there. It ain't ever going to be resolved. There's no future for us. But we can still date. We can still explore the connection we have. We can still see what kind of chemistry we have for as long as it takes. And as long as you're good to me, I will be good to you. And if I meet somebody who's better suited for me, you'll know that I'm not leaving you just because. I would leave you if I meet somebody who, who's able to give me more of the things that I want for my future. It's predictable. And that power of predictability is where you have the power to say, I can address this emotional need. She knows what's going to happen. She's not being abandoned on the, on the street where you're going to just hate her for the rest of your life. She knows that, oh, the same way that she has the ability and the freedom to find a partner better suited to her, you do as well. Right. So my way of interpreting this is essentially is trust. If she can trust that if and when your relationship with her ends, she can still trust that you'll take care of her either by protecting her reputation or remaining a friend or just taking her into consideration. And that's uh, that's actually essentially emotional need number six, right? Well, guys, that concludes part one of my interview with Frank Kermit. Tune in to part two in which Frank addresses the remaining five emotional needs of women and shares his story about how he was able to have multiple open relationships before he got married. Also in part two, I will give you the information about how you can get Frank's third product giveaway. Just as a small tip, it is a five-set audio program, but you will have to listen to find out what it's about and where to get it. As a reminder, to get your free copy of Frank's three-set audio program called The Art of Charisma, From Creepy to Charisma, head on over to the show notes for episode 14 called Using Body Language to Create Attraction with Patty Contenta and find the link under the title Free Giveaway. For Frank's ebook, The Emotional Needs of Women, you can head on over to the show notes for this episode and find the link under the same title Free Giveaway. If you do not remember the direct links to these pages, which I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, then just go to the podcast page at mensdatingmastery.com and browse through the list to find them. It's pretty easy. Finally, to get a free copy of Frank's book with a collection of his best articles, go to franktalks.com forward slash newsletter and sign up. That's it for this week's episode. Thanks for listening. And until next time. Thank you for listening to Men's Dating Mastery, a podcast dedicated to improving the lives of men and the women around them.